So good afternoon, welcome uh, to this lecture about communicating science in the kitchen, Newton's chicken. I will start by showing a short video. Uh, it's, it's in Italian but with English subtitles. And it's from a, a TV show about science. And there's a section, this is the most popular Italian TV show about science. It's a section about science in the kitchen. La scienza in cucina perché i cuochi sono a loro modo degli inventori di reazioni chimiche. Eh, ogni settimana affronteremo uno dei tanti aspetti della scienza in cucina e oggi cominceremo dalla maionese. La maionese è una specie di miracolo perché partendo da tre cose liquide, eh, cioè olio, eh, uova, eh, succo di limone, costruisce una cosa così densa che un cucchiaino può starci piantato dentro come una bandiera. Ma ah, qual è il segreto? Beh, a tutti è capitato di sbagliare una maionese, di farla impazzire, come si dice, senza capire bene il perché. Come si fa a evitare che la maionese vada male? Per cominciare, Michelangelo Pepe è andato a porre qualche domanda a un certo numero di persone per sondare la loro cultura sulla maionese. Ecco le loro risposte. Tu quante volte l'anno la fai? Cosa? La maionese. La maionese? Io personalmente, io non ho mai fatto, veramente. Ci pensa mia moglie, mi socia. Sì, con l'uovo, il limone, l'uovo, il limone e poi basta. Uova e l'olio. Forse un po' di prezzemolo tritato, passate cioè con, con la farina. Cioè, sì, lo so, so non me la ricordo adesso. Normalmente con olio, l'uova, perché? Praticamente viene emulsionato l'uovo con il... Eh, con l'olio. E il meccanismo per cui si forma la maionese? Eh, no, non lo so, sarà una fermentazione, non lo so. Come sarebbe un meccanismo perché se non c'è degli incidenti? Che mi ha detto? Non so. E eh, la maionese l'ha mai fatta? No, I don't speak Italian. E impazzisce la maionese? Oddio, non è che ci vado pazza, eh? Come impazzisce? Cosa bisogna fare quando impazzisce? Non lo so, buttarla. Lei quante volte all'anno la fa? Eh, almeno 9-10 mesi all'anno. La maionese? Ah, mai fatta, la compro già fatta. Limone? E uova? La maionese va girata sempre dallo stesso verso. E perché c'è qualche cosa che la fa smontare? Non sappiamo nessuno se perché, non credo che esista un perché. Sì, c'è per diversi motivi, può essere la temperatura sbagliata delle uova, la temperatura sbagliata dell'uovo. Tutti gli ingredienti devono essere freddi. L'importante è questo, sia l'olio che le uova. Non essere poste in frigorifero un paio d'ore. Probabilmente ci metto parecchio olio tutto insieme, insieme perché mi si stanca il braccio e quindi impazzisce. Quando impazzisce c'è un sistema per recuperarla? È, è molto difficile, però di solito si usa per aggiungere un tuorlo a parte, ricominciare il montaggio con un tuorlo e poi piano piano aggiungere la maionese impazzita. Durante un temporale la faresti la maionese? No, non è la maionese durante il temporale, no. No, mai. Perché? Perché vorrei dormire e stare sotto le coperte. Ci sono alcune dicerie che parlano di temporali, parlano di donne in certi periodi, parlano di influenza, di febbre, di temperature alte della persona che le esegue, di indisposizioni. Pare che contribuiscano a non farla montare. Ma non sa che impazzisce la maionese? <ride> sì, ma non come con le donne in genere. <ride> Grazie. Ognuno insomma ha una sua teoria, noi abbiamo la nostra e per sperimentarla abbiamo realizzato una candid camera. Con il pretesto di un concorso per il miglior... So this is a cooking class uh, and the, this, this women will try to prepare a mayonnaise. Abbiamo installato delle telecamere nascoste in una scuola privata di arte culinaria. Le signore per preparare i loro piatti dovevano innanzitutto realizzare la maionese con gli ingredienti che c'erano tutti. So the science TV show has placed a hidden camera to watch. This. Ecco il risultato.
So it doesn't work. They cannot make mayonnaise. La maionese non monta, niente da fare. Ogni candidata, malgrado gli sforzi, si ritrova disperatamente con la maionese andata male. E addio con te per il miglior piatto decorato. In realtà siamo stati noi, naturalmente, ad inserire nella prova un piccolo trucco per far impazzire la maionese. So they have done somebody, something to, to make it impossible to make mayonnaise come. Per ben iniziare cosa succede quando la maionese monta normalmente. Semplifichiamo molto le cose. Si prende dunque olio, fuoco d'uovo e succo di limone. Per capire il meccanismo abbiamo messo in questo contenitore che vedete dell'acqua e dell'olio. Se si sbatte si formano goccioline d'olio separate. Più si sbatte, più diventano piccole. Questo tutti lo sanno. Dopo un po' di tempo, però, queste goccioline, goccioline d'olio, tendono a ricongiungersi nuovamente. Ecco, già lo si può osservare. Nel giro di qualche minuto l'olio si ricompone in chiazze sempre più grandi e alla fine troveremo nuovamente olio e acqua separati. Olio e acqua, in altre parole, non stanno insieme. Nella maionese, invece, le cose vanno diversamente. Nella maionese, infatti, c'è dell'acqua. 50% del polvo d'uovo è composto d'acqua e anche nel limone c'è acqua. Eppure in questo caso acqua e olio si legano. Come mai? Il segreto sta in questa sostanza, si chiama lecitina e si trova nel polvo d'uovo. Se noi torniamo dalla nostra miscela d'acqua e di olio versando dentro della lecitina e la sbattiamo nuovamente, le goccioline d'olio questa volta non si ricongiungeranno più, rimarranno separate. Perché? Perché questa lecitina va a disporsi tutto intorno alle goccioline d'olio, formando uno strato di molecole che, verso l'esterno, hanno tutte una carica elettrica dello stesso segno. E così, come due poli dello stesso segno di una calamita si respingono, analogamente le goccioline d'olio a questo punto tendono a respingersi e non si ricongiungono più. Non solo. Ma queste molecole di lecitina nella parte esterna sono idrofili, cioè si legano all'acqua. E tutta la struttura in questo modo tiene insieme. Ma è un equilibrio instabile, basta poco a farlo crollare. Nel nostro caso abbiamo adottato un piccolo trucco per far impazzire la maionese. Nell'olio abbiamo inserito un pizzico di antiemulsionante, cioè una particolare sostanza che sembra un po' al sale, eh, che agisce in senso contrario alla lecitina. E' bastato questo a far crollare la costruzione e a far impazzire la maionese. E niente, non va. So, why, why uh, do I find so interesting this, this program? Uh, because as you see, this uh, is a quite different strategy uh, from communicating science than the one which is used, for example, uh, with particle physics or astrophysics. So uh, science is not presented as something distant from ordinary experience, hmm? but to some extent is intruding into common sense, into an area that people uh, deal with in everyday life, uh, like the kitchen, like cooking. So it's actually uh, using uh, common sense mm, and uh, as a starting point, uh, something that people think they know <laughs> about, uh, for example, making mayonnaise. But then science is coming with the scientific explanation. So to some extent it's upgrading common sense. It's starting from with something familiar uh, and it's enlightening it. Uh, so I, I got interested in this strategy and when I explored this further along the years, I discovered there are many ways in which science is using cooking and cooking is using science that might be of interest to understand the relationship between science and society and science and culture. And this is the result. It's a book 
which I published this year in Italian and it's coming out in, in other languages, uh, which is built like a menu. There's, a, there's an antipasto, there's a starter, there's a main course, which is about the science of chicken. Chicken is coming in many ways in the history of science. Uh, there is uh, the chapter on drinks, beer, wine, coffee, tea, chocolate, and controversies. There is a dessert followed by the digestive, mm, uh, from Brilla Savarin to molecular gastronomy and uh, futurist kitchen. So today I'm, I'm going very briefly to, to uh, uh, go through this book and uh, try, try to, to give you a sense of why it might be interesting to reflect on the relationship between science uh, and cooking. So let me start from uh, you know, the, same, the same point I was making with the TV show. Hmm? It's more and more common. This is just a list of a few books, uh, uh, all of them in English, uh, but of course there are many in different languages, which use cooking hmm, and the kitchen to popularize science. Uh, recipes for science fun, the science cookbooks. Some of these books are aimed at, uh, at children. Other books are more general popularization books, like what Einstein told this cook, and so on. Uh, this is a game. It's one of the many games. I'm sure you've seen games of installations. Uh, this is called Laboratory in the Kitchen, which are using, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the chemistry and the physics of cooking to introduce, for example, science to, to children. Uh, but, uh, of course, there is, uh, this is a story which we can trace, uh, uh, this connection between science and cooking, uh, very, very early in the, in the history of our civilization. Uh, this is from a 17th century uh, book, which is a book about cooking, about preparing food for the table, and you see how carefully is the perfect school for instruction for the officer of the mouth, uh, it, and, and it's called, this image is called the dissection of a boiled hen. Hmm? So very, very close to an anatomical uh, table to some extent. Uh, this is a book, again, from the early 17th century. It's called The English Housewife. And you see immediately from the frontispiece that the first skill that the housewife should have was a skill in physic. Hmm? Physic, cookery, banquety, distillation, and so on. Hmm? And there is, a, as I said, there's a very early and very important tradition in this. I'm, I'm showing you here a quote from a very famous Italian book uh, of the uh, Renaissance, which is about, uh, it's a book describing crafts and professions, and, and look how describes the profession of butchers, saying that it's not very different from anatomist, the only difference being that anatomists skin and dismember human dead bodies, and sometimes cut living bodies too, while the butchers tear apart and dismember animal bodies with much less pity than it is done in the anatomical workshop. Uh, this phenomenon explodes, this, uh, this parallel and this uh, intersection between science and cooking really blooms and actually explodes uh, through the 19th century and early 20th century. Hmm? Here I've just, uh, I'm just showing three of the most uh, popular and famous uh, books which were using uh, science and scientific knowledge to explain or to... to, to teach about cooking. Uh, this is a Friedrich Kakum, physicist, uh, chemist, sorry, uh, the culinary, explaining the culinary chemistry exhibiting the scientific principle of cookery. Uh, in the middle, there is a classic French book, it's called The Physiologie du Goût, hmm? uh, which starts with a very famous uh, opening sentence saying that uh, for the human civilization is more important a new receipt than discovering a new planet. And, and it's basically claiming what this Bridia Savarin is claiming is that uh, cooking has to become a science, hmm? has to, to, to make uh, its, uh, its place and its room in the pantheon of the other scientists. And of course, learn from what other sciences have already done. <laughs> He describes very interesting experiments that you can do 
in tasting, for example, uh, food. And this is an Italian book, which is the most widely translated and circulated Italian book, translated in many languages, after Pinocchio. Hmm? It's called La Scienza in Cucina, Science in the Kitchen, and it's by Pellegrino Artusi, and, and uh, that's already very interesting, that a man who was not a scientist, he was an entrepreneur, uh, with a strong interest in food, decides to call his book in 1891, uh, Science in the Kitchen. Actually, there is not much science in this book. Hmm? Uh, in some receipts, uh, it's quite interesting that, for example, before giving the res a recipe uh, for, for preparing a certain fish, he gives some uh, scientific description and classification of the fish, uh, according for, to, to uh, zoology, for example. But uh, why is he, is, he using, is he choosing this title? It's, of course, because the main reason is that science has become a very important thing from a cultural point of view. Hmm? As you know, uh, this is the age, uh, the end of the 19th century, where science is fascinating writers like Jules Verne, for example, uh, some, some popularizers are selling hundreds of thousand copies. Uh, for example, in the UK, there is a huge market for popularization, even by, by contemporary standards. So science, if you wish, is becoming something chic, uh, something fashionable. And this is why partly Brigia Savarin and, and uh, uh, Pellegrino Artusi are, are uh, invoking science. So this is... Again, just a few examples, uh, the science of nutrition, the chemistry of cooking and cleaning, the chemistry of cookery, science in the daily meal, uh, and also journals. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, magazines and journals which are opening what will become the field of domestic science. Look at this, for example. This is one of the bestsellers of the time. It's called Science in the Kitchen, again by Ervila Kellogg, an American writer. And you see in the top uh, right corner, uh, there are symbols of science actually physically uh, present in the, in the kitchen. And I have a quotation from, from this book. It's a very interesting quotation, uh, saying that basically that cooking is lagging behind the march of scientific progress, mm, that su cooking is still, you see, uh, the art of cookery, she says, is at least a century behind the march of progress. The mistress of the kitchen is still groping her way amid the uncertainties of medieval methods. The chemistry of cookery is little known to the average housewives. And then she said, uh, uh, the cooking is still in the, in the situation of alchemy, eh? still trying to transmute lead and copper into silver and gold. Uh, so we have to move, uh, she says, to a new type, more scientific-based and more knowledgeable cookery um, by the elucidation of the principles which govern the operations of the kitchen with the same certainty with which the law of gravity rules the planets. Mm? This is... Uh, how powerful the idea that science, uh, that, that cookery has become scientific, that cookery, um, that, that of likening cookery to science. And this is uh, a very important scientist and entrepreneur, uh, was called Liebig, and Liebig uh, uh, makes a fortune by, uh, starts these, uh, these profitable activities of meat, extracts, but at some point he has big trouble uh, with his colleagues, uh, with fellow scientists and especially medical specialists who are actually questioning the nutritional value of this meat extract. Hmm? For example, one of, his, one of these scientists at some point uh, com uh, compares this meat extract to a Hamlet theater play without the character of Hamlet. Hmm? So they say this, this meat extract, we actually don't know if they're still keeping the nutritional value of meat. But how, the, how Liebig uh, actually wins his, his uh, uh, battle is by actually targeting another public, not the public of his colleague scientists, but for example, the public of housewives. For the housewives, is very, uh, these, um, uh, these meat extracts which make easier 
cooking and making broth, for example, are very appealing, are very, um, uh, are a very uh, appealing uh, solution, and, and in the end, they make it a big success. And you see also how skillful uh, Liebig is in marketing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a series of cars. This is one of the first to create a sort of fidelization program by putting in the product these, uh, these pictures that people could collect. Uh, this is, for example, is a picture of his own laboratory, and it's signed on the back by, uh, by the scientists. So to sort of uh, give scientific credit uh, and give scientific trademark to this, to this product. Uh, you can still buy some uh, of these uh, collectors around the world pay uh, hundreds and thousands of euros to, to get them. Um, drinks. Of course, drinks, when they come to Europe, I'm talking about, uh, you know, at the time, exotic drinks like coffee or chocolate or tea. Uh, of course, get uh, the, the scientists, uh, the, the early modern scientists, who are very curious people, uh, are very interested in, in understanding what are the properties uh, of these, uh, of these uh, drinks. And uh, there are a number of controversies which start, for example, about whether coffee is good for the health of people. There is a, manif there is a, <clears throat> a petition by the women, uh, by a group of women in London in the 17th century, uh, which uh, supporting their claims with the, uh, with the words of scientists at the time, ask the king to, to prohibit coffee because they say it makes uh, it's, it's dangerous for the sex of their men. Hmm? It makes uh, the men incapable or, or less powerful in sex. And then the men respond, quoting other scientific <laughs> expertise, saying it's the opposite. Actually, coffee makes us more uh, sexually more active and powerful. Um, this is, uh, of course, it's, it's a picture from later on, but this is uh, one of the coffee houses where the fellows of the Royal Society used to meet after their scientific meetings and experiments, Garraways. And actually, <coughs> uh, in this uh, coffee house, uh, actually some experiments also took place. For example, Hook, uh, uh, who was involved in a very strong controversy, as you probably know, uh, with Newton, uh, Hooke, at some point, he, since he was studying, <clears throat> he was interested in studying the earth rotation, and he needed a place, a very high place, to throw things and, and measure uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the difference when coming to the, to the ground. Uh, he chose a coffee place because it had a very high ceiling. So you can imagine people having coffee or tea, and in the middle, Robert Hooke and the people from the Royal Society are making the experiment. This, this was in 1685. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the petition. I mentioned the women's petition against coffee, which, as I said, was also invoking some scientific um, expertise. And that's the response, uh, the man's answer to the women's petition. Um, another example coming later on, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, is the Manifesto of Futuristic Cuisine, hmm? which starts, actually, 1930. Uh, the first point of this manifesto is to abolish pasta. Hmm? Why the futurists want to abolish pasta? Because, uh, you know, futurists were very much interested in pushing progress, modernity, and to them, uh, science and technology, everything which is fast, Everything which is light hmm, uh, is incarnating modernity. Hmm? So pasta for them is tradition, is the past, is something you know, which makes people uh, too weight and too fat. So uh, it, it should be abolished. And what they invoke, <clears throat> this is a very nice uh, picture, for example, by a famous futurist artist, Fortunato De Pero. It's a futuristic aperitive. Uh, uh, what they invoke is, as I, as I mentioned, a more scientific cuisine that in, in their mind has to be uh, very light, uh, made of powders, 
of gases almost, or, or ta of tablets. Now, this, this is uh, uh, quite interesting for a number of reasons. The first reason is that, of course, futurists, they don't know much about science, but they take science as an aesthetical model. Hmm? As I said, you know, the uh, civilization is about uh, uh, scientific, technological progress, so uh, cooking cannot, cannot lag behind. Hmm? This is a very, their, their, their main point. And the second thing is, they, this, uh, this strange manifesto actually had a very big impact on the popular imagination about food. I don't know if you remember uh, 2001 Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, eh? when, when this person in the space station is asking for a meal, he's receiving tablets, little pow powders. So this idea uh, that the food of the future, that the science-based food will be lighter, will be uh, sort of almost dematerialized. This has stayed, has stayed with us. Uh, actually, in the book, I mentioned that actually some chefs, some cooks, took futurists seriously, and they made some, uh, some dishes uh, under the inspiration of this manifesto. One of the most interesting one is a chicken with uh, uh, iron, small iron balls inside during the cooking so that the, the, the chicken at the end, again, the chicken, will taste you know, more modern, more metallic, <laughs> more uh, everything that uh, for futurists was positive. Um, now, uh, this, this uh, metaphor or this parallel, you know, as I said so far, that cooking uh, is a science or that cooking can be likened to science, has a very interesting parallel in a history of science in the metaphor of science as cooking. Mm? And this is, uh, this is a very interesting quotation by Francesco Redi, which is one of the founders of modern biology. Uh, this is from his laboratory net notebooks. Huh? Uh, Reddy was, was very, uh, very much into anatomical dissection of animals. For example, he was one of the first to understand how the poison, how snakes can poison people or, or other animals. And he, he has just finished, in this note, uh, dissecting the brain of a deer. Hmm? So after the dissection, he says, basically, everybody says that you shouldn't eat the brain of deer, and it's not a good thing, but they seeming to me beautiful and well-made brains and of good substance, I took the risk, despite my servant being ashamed of taking this Lutheran villain in the kitchen, so his servant didn't want to cook this thing, try this to discourage, uh, I had a solemn pan of it cooked in virgin fat that came to my table piping hot and well roasted, and I frankly enjoyed it, and found with reiterated true and certain experience that deer brain is a noble thing, very savory and healthy, and much better than the pig or the veal brain, not to mention the dolphin brain, which is the finest, for, for him, the finest of all brains, considering that one can eat them during Lent and other compulsory fasts. Uh, obviously, the classification of the dolphin wasn't completely clear to, to Reddy at the time. But, but here, <clears throat> I said, what we found is spectacularly conjoined uh, the idea of tasting and experimenting. Because Reddy, uh, as a in a typical, uh, with the typical stubbornness uh, of early you know, uh, scientists, is not believing something a common sense, uh, a commonsensical stereotype, what the other people, he want to try by himself. And since uh, these, these brains look nice, uh, they, should, they should be good. So he tries, he makes actually, you know, uh, a very nice conjunction of uh, a personal tasting and an experiment. Uh, Claude Barnard, uh, considered by Pasteur uh, is, uh, you know, is, is master and, and the, 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 the starter of experimental physiology. In his uh, biography, when he says, 
uh, if I had to describe what I feel about the life sciences, he said, je dirais que c'est un salon superbe, tous les resplendissants de lumière, dans lesquels on ne peut pas parvenir qu'en passant par une longue et fraise cuisine. So it's a wonderful, life sciences, the knowledge of the life sciences is a wonderful, superb, enlightened salon, but to get to, get to this salon, you have to go through a smelly, ghastly kitchen. Of course, science as cookery is very much used by scientists when they fight among each other, eh? when they want, for example, to criticize or disparage what another scientist is doing and they think is not correct. Uh, this is a sketch made by a scientist, De La Beche, eh? about Lyell. Lyell was a geologist. Uh, so De La Beche is making fun of Lyell's theory uh, saying, uh, depicting Lyell as somebody holding a pan of soup uh, and, and fooling, you see the people are blinded, fooling other colleagues with the smell. Mm? And, uh, and actually Lyell himself had lent, uh, lent in his theory prone to this comparison by saying that it was uh, like a receipt. It was a simple receipt. Mm? But as I said, uh, the comparison of science to cooking is very much used when criticizing or disparaging uh, other scientists' work. This is a famous story which you probably remember, the cold fusion case. Uh, these two scientists, uh, Pons and Fleischmann, would claim they had achieved the, uh, cold fusion at, uh, at, uh, uh, in, with very simple means. And you see how many, of course, I'm not going to read through all of these, how many articles in the newspapers, how many quotes by scientists uh, use a cooking metaphor. What's cooking in the test tube? Uh, uh, the cold fusion makes us think to a cream and chocolate ice cream cone. Um, one month ago, cold fusion was a medical dream, and now everybody cooks it, like a humdrum risotto. Uh, and so on. And I think this is a quote by Carlo Rubbia who said, fusion is not like whipped cream that rises or does not rise for reason unknown to the cook, hmm? uh, like in the mayonnaise case. So, you know, when, uh, uh, again, uh, using this, uh, this comparison to criticize uh, some theory or some result that doesn't work. But again, uh, the, the two scientists, Pons and Fleischmann, that themselves had used this, uh, uh, this metaphor. We were so enthusiastic, we decided to try in the kitchen of my house. We started in my kitchen, and so on. Uh, these, these are some of the many comics that were published around the world. Uh, you know, something not very nice is smelling in this pan, and it's fusion. This is Mrs. Emily Trudel, who was making a cake for the Bridge Club and has discovered fusion, and so on. Let me conclude by uh, go going even more backwards in the history of thought and reflection and uh, uh, using uh, some, some quotes from Gorgias, from Plato's Gorgia. Uh, in this dialogue, uh, Socrates is repeatedly comparing medicine and cooking. Uh, saying, for example, that cookery takes the form of medicine, pretends to know what foods are best for the body. So if a cook and a doctor had to contend before boys or before men as foolish as boys, hmm, so they, if people, if foolish people <laughs> had to decide uh, who's better, the doctor or the cook, hmm? the doctor will starve to death. Everybody would prefer the cook because, says Socrates, uh, already anticipating his trial, huh? I will be like a doctor tried by a bench of children on a charge brought by the cook. And the cook could say, children, this fellow has done you all of great deal and personal mischiefs uh, because the doctor cuts and burns and starves and chokes you to distraction, giving you nasty bitter droughts and forcing you to fast and thirst. Not like me, the cook, uh, who used to gorge you with abundance of nice things of every sort. So he's contrasting very sharply 
cooking and, uh, and uh, medicine. Uh, of course, a number of things has, have changed uh, from, from this quotation to the example I have showed you from the Science in the Kitchen program and the cooking course. But let me uh, note that something has remained common. And what has remained common is the idea of the public as passive and uh, sort of uh, diminished and incapable of uh, actually discerning about knowledge. Hmm? Here, it's a bunch of children hmm, who, of course, don't know about medicine, so they will always prefer cooking. And in the, in the video, it was the women of the cooking course who were fooled by science. So uh, the reason for this is, of course, that the, uh, that the communication mechanism here is downgrading common sense because then science can come into play and make its room and beautifully enlightened knowledge. So this was my, uh, my main point, and uh, of course there are many, uh, many examples uh, in the book, many more examples in the book, starting from the one which gives the, the title Newton's Chicken, which I will not reveal here. <laughs> But of course, I'd be delighted if you have questions or comments. Thank you. Yes? Uh, do you personally, uh, in your research, which you are sorry, uh, interest in a different domain, or are you like, What is my background, you mean? Uh, no. Not really, but your, your research, uh, more exactly. Okay. I, I, I was trained in the history and sociology of science, so I'm a sociologist. I study how science and society communicate or not communicate in some cases. So, for example, just to, uh, to answer your question, uh, I do a lot of empirical research about what people think about science. I've been working with the European Commission and uh, many other organizations uh, in doing also empirical studies about trust and attitudes to science, to specific issues like nuclear energy, GMOs, stem cells. Is that, is that what you wanted to know? Yeah. So this is, uh, this, this is a sort of a, uh, different, if you wish, more uh, um, accessible approach to the same question. Because actually you can use the kitchen to follow the story of science and society intersection. This, this is my reason for, for writing this book. Thank you. Oh, so oh thank you, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know this, uh, this manifesto. Ah, thank you, thank you. Any other question? Are you from CERN or you came for the open days? Most of you. Open days. Okay. So, thank you. I hope you enjoy 